All right, so for tonight then, um, we are covering forging your own path. And, and what does that mean? Um, so we, I think everyone's aware, you know, technology is taking over the world and there is more technology everywhere in our everyday lives all the time. Um, but actually in terms of representation in cybersecurity, um, there's still only roughly around 20% um, of women in the industry. Uh, that's based on an, an oft quoted statistic from last year by Cybersecurity Ventures and a research that they did into that. Um, we have lots of initiatives. Uh, NCSC's Cyber First, for example, is, is a great example of, of trying to get people interested in cybersecurity early. Um, but it'd be interesting tonight just to discuss why there aren't maybe more women um, coming into the industry and in fact just delving into whether there are real barriers um, or whether it's just a perception that there might be barriers that exist that might be stopping people from from taking the step into the industry um, so we'll be talking in, in quite a casual way just understanding what it's really like to work in the industry what you might need to study to get into the industry uh, and what it's like to study um, and also just do you need to study uh, so we're, we're questioning as well whether you need qualifications at all or whether you can just get started and learn on the job um, so we'll be exploring that and we'll also be exploring how do you then actually find a job so i thought we, we'd start off with just um asking my colleague joni green um what is it like a day in the life of of working in your role in info security uh, and perhaps first joni if you wouldn't mind just introducing yourself and and telling us what your job is Thanks, Julia. Uh, yes, so I work for F Secure Consulting in London. I'm a senior incident response consultant and the team lead for our UK incident response team. And I specialize in incident response and digital forensics, but I also have a background in offensive security. And a typical day for me looks like um, when we, we, we help our clients basically on what they might think is a, is a really bad day for them. And sometimes it is the, the worst day of their careers. So we help them when they've been compromised. Um, so they might have either experienced a historical compromise or a, a live attack. Um, and we can basically deal with either of those. And uh, we also help them prepare for the, the eventuality of incidents. So for me, um, every day is pretty much very different. So I've got a lot of variety. It's uh, no client is ever the same. Um, no incident is ever the same. So it's quite challenging, but um, I enjoy it because that means I'm constantly learning and improving and just growing as a person. Yeah, thanks, Janie. It's definitely an, an exciting side of cybersecurity. Well, it, exciting, I suppose, and also uh, not great if you're actually having an incident. Um, but if you're working in incident response, I guess it's quite exciting uh, being in the thick of it and uh, yeah, defending attackers. Um, if I could just come to you, Hannah, um, and uh, if, again, if you wouldn't mind just introducing yourself and, and your background and just giving us your perspective on on what it's actually like um, to be working in InfoSec. Hi, thank you. Um, so yeah, uh, my name's Hannah Gale um, and I lead a, a pen test coordination team um, for Barclays Bank. Um, and what's a typical day in life of? Um, I love my role because not only do I support the um, my business to um, improve their risk posture by um, supporting them coordinating and working with um, specialists, um, you know, pen test uh, consultants to actually conduct um, a pen test assessment, but also thinking about um, what, you know, what technologies are coming down the track, um, you know, um, what potential security threats do they, will they actually introduce? Um, and um, then making sure that we've got agreements that actually align so that we maintain a solid and um, very strong risk posture. Um, and, and that obviously has a wonderful knock-on impact because what we're doing is we're protecting our customers. So, you know, we're protecting our customers' um, data and their finance, um, um, you know, so um, and, and obviously I think we all probably use banks. So, you know, it's, it's nice to know that your money's protected. Um, and and, um, and then the second part really is um, I get to work with um, senior leadership and actually uh, build a strategy. So what are we going to do in the future? You know, uh, what contracts do we need? Uh, what um, 
what resource do we need um, and um, yeah uh, so again constantly learning because technology is changing um, and um, uh, yeah it's uh, it's an interesting space to be in it's great fun yeah, it sounds like um, no day is ever the same, whether you're in incident response or actually involved in strategy and um, yeah, protecting customers and protecting business. And uh, it's interesting to touch on, on those elements there. Um, Louise, if I could come to you, because I know um, just again, if you don't mind sort of introducing yourself and giving a bit of background, I know that it's, um, it's sometimes off-putting for, for women, in fact, in, in any industry, um, after having children, sort of trying to get get a job where they can balance, you know, work and life and manage time. Um, if you don't mind uh, sharing your perspective and how you managed to juggle that in your role, that would be great. Sure. Thanks, Julia. Um, yeah, my name is Louise Coburn. I am the Security and Culture Awareness Manager for a company called Quilter. Um, and that basically means that I'm looking at the human side of security. So um, what sort of attacks we're going to see uh, for the people at the end of the computers. So anything around phishing, social engineering, um, those kind of human to human attacks. And then we look at how we can improve everybody's security hygiene and make them safer both at work and at home and uh, improve the security culture of the company. Um, I also, you touched upon the fact that I'm, I'm working as part of a job share now. So I have a job share partner, Linda who's my, my life partner at work <laughs> and um, we, we share the role. So um, I work Monday to Wednesday and she works Wednesday to Friday. And um, I've been doing that since I got back from maternity in October last year. And it's been phenomenal so far. <laughs> That's great to hear, it's good to have flexibility. And um, I, I think it's just interesting as well to, um, for everyone to be aware that actually having a role in, in cybersecurity doesn't necessarily mean it's a, a technical role or you know we've um, we've got so many roles available to us actually uh, in this industry and lots of options and um, hopefully everyone will, will take away there that it's um, it's flexible it's changing um, there's lots of learning going on um, and it is one of those environments I think that actually is appealing to everybody um, there's, there's lots available to do um, if, if we think then about sort of getting into the industry um, or for, the, for those people who perhaps are thinking about it but don't quite know where to start, um, are there any barriers that exist? I think this is an interesting one um, because there's the perception, I think, as I mentioned at the beginning, that um, it might be difficult to get into the industry or it's all about having technical qualifications or you have to be really great at problem solving or you have to be really great um, on computers um, and I think you know that's not always the case um, but it you know there's, there's lots of options out there but even going through um, studying can can have various um, impacts on us and you know we can start to feel as though perhaps we're not in the right place or we can't do something but I, I'd like to ask our panel about some of their experiences in trying to get into InfoSec and the different paths that they've maybe taken or hear the importance of that you know, do you need a qualification or are there any barriers to entry? And Roha, if I could come to you first, because I know that you um, you did come through university routes and if you wouldn't mind just um, introducing yourself and, and telling us a little bit about your experience through uni, that would be great. No, thanks, Julia. So, yeah, so my name's Roha. Um, I'm currently uh, working at Sainsbury's and leading their um, security awareness programme. Um, so yeah, like, like Julia said, I studied um, cyber security with forensics at Sheffield Hallam University. And when I first started, um, there was hardly anything to do with cyber security. This was four years ago now. And I remember when we were applying for placements, there was hardly any placements in cyber. And I used to sit there and think, am I ever going to get a job in cyber? Because it doesn't look like there are any placements. And I think as well, when I was in my first year, so I came without a technical background. So I studied A-levels, I did politics, I did psychology, I, um, I did um, English literature, I, I forgot now, um, I did English literature. And when I came into uni, I actually felt like I couldn't do it because there was such a massive push in being technical. I remember going into my lecturer's office and just telling her that I wanted to drop out because I just didn't think this course was for me. And there was such a massive push in being technical. And I think that's one of 
probably the biggest barriers at uni is that there is very little talk about how softer skills can help you accelerate in a career in cyber. And now that I'm um, working and I'm leading a program in security awareness, I've come to find that actually the cyber security skills and the technical skills are really important but what gets you through every day and what's going to help me implement my program and make my strategy successful is my stake um you know managing stakeholders it's my communication skills it's my it's how do i present what do i do if you know problem solving like you mentioned um, and something else that i experienced was you know i loved uni it was a great experience i learned from everyone but there was very few female role models to look up to and I think that's something that looking back now, I would love to see more females, more women, maybe lecturing more women coming in and talking about their experiences. And it's only that now I've gone into work and I've experienced some of the things women experience or some of the difficulties or some of the things that actually work well for women. I've actually realised that we could have done this earlier on in my academic career. Yeah, thanks, Roha. It's really interesting. And um... If you don't mind sharing, what made you not give up when you went to your lecturer's office and said, look, I, I can't do this? Was there anything that, that changed aside from, I suppose, just will and motivation? Was there, was there any sort of catalyst to make you continue? So the first thing was she was a female and um, she was a female lecturer and she said, stop, you can't go. And I said, no, I'm terrible. I don't want to stay here. I, I, I can't do this. And, and that day I'd actually sat an exam and I got like 83% on it and she looked at it she was like there's no way you're going like I'm not going to let you go you're staying and you're going to make it work and I was like okay like I walked away thinking okay I don't have a choice here but I think having a powerful female actually who was leading the course and someone to look up to and having that support there really helped me. Yeah thank you and it's, it's an interesting point as well that you raised about um softer skills as well or just being aware of what uh, what might be needed in the role later on and um, Emma, I know that you have some thoughts about um, encouraging girls to get involved in info security early. Um, I wondered if I could just come to you for, for your opinion and your experience, and if you wouldn't mind as well, just introducing yourself to everybody. Uh, yeah, sure. Hi, I'm Emma Griffin. Um, I'm currently the uh, Deputy CISO uh, for Sky Group. Um, I've got um, 25 years sort of technology and cyber experience across a, a, a multitude of different sort of organisations. Spent a lot of my time in finance sector, um, which is very different from media and telco where I am now. So again, it makes it quite an, an interesting space. Um, I think I think it's really important to to try and encourage this. We have a real skills shortage in in, in cyber security, so we, we've got to do something to encourage people to to get into the sector. I took an unconventional route to, to coming into cyber security and I think we've got to think about how we encourage people. When I started out my um, education and career, there were you know very little computing courses and, and you know, cyber security courses were non-existent. So um, I you know was applying to university but feeling uninspired about the career path I was going to go down. So I actually started my career as an ambulance controller for London Ambulance Service. Uh, looking after Northwest London and you know, managing crisis and and you know lots of moving parts, very stressful, um, highly intense job. Um, and then by accident, sort of got into IT. So um, my appendix burst while I was uh, um, there. And while I was on sick leave, I started picking up some books. And, and my my partner at the time encouraged me to to you know play around with a computer. So that forged and inspired me to think, okay, well maybe I could do you know, have a career in computing. So I, you know, again, sort of did some self-study, did lots of reading with lots of support and encouragement, managed to start my career in, in, in IT. And that again was ground up, you know, entry level job, um, I work my way through lots of self-study, lots of just picking up you know study guides and, and reading them on the train and after several years in you know technology roles realized where i'd been working on sort of cyber related projects i really wanted to go down the information security and cyber route so again it was that you know i, I picked a, a study guide um bought it on amazon did some self-study and um, got my first cyber qualification um my sis at the time and then it was a case of you know sort of like you know working out where you go from there and 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 hunting down someone who would who would advise me it took me a year to get my first sort of cyber job and um, but then that was a, a case of doing it and i wanted to then think about okay well, 
how would you open the door for the people behind you? Because, you know, without that help and, and, and someone opening the door for me, we've got to do that. But you've got to find that inspiration first and, um, and work out where you go from there. Yeah, thanks. Really interesting story. And I didn't realise that you'd made your way into the industry through a burst appendix. That's um... <laughs> what you can yeah. do on <laughs> Um and yeah, I think uh, as I, I mentioned uh, cyber first briefly before, but um, I think it's it's important to um, and you know we've we've mentioned role models as well being absolutely crucial. Um, and you know perhaps early on it's a case of making girls aware that um, you know what what working in cybersecurity means, and it's not um, necessarily something that they can't do, or that you know as Ro have felt you know you'd have to be really good at you know all the technical stuff first or the, or even that the technical stuff is really hard and inaccessible and you know that you'd never be able to to get there and, and understand it so um yeah i know that there are schemes in existence and you know we're encouraging that and um hopefully people realize what's out there i think sometimes people don't realize actually uh what is available to them uh but it'd be great for us also to encourage the younger generation to um see what's what's possible and what's available um and I know everybody on the panel tonight, if anyone's watching and needs a mentor, uh, we're, we're all hoping to hold the door open for you. So, uh, so reach out to us. Um, if, we then, if we then actually move on to how do you find a job in InfoSec? So um, we've spoken about studying and um, what you might need to learn. Um, so finding a job in InfoSec um, and also then hiring for people in InfoSec. I thought we'd look first at sort of the, the job seekers perspective. Um, so, you know, and again, just to hear some some interesting stories. And I wonder, um, Eliza, if I could come to you because uh, I, I love your story. Um, and if, if you don't mind me sharing that you, uh, when, before you started working for Ethical, you didn't actually own a computer, which I think is uh, is fantastic example of, of learning on the job. <laughs> Um, but perhaps if you don't mind just introducing yourself and uh, giving us a bit of background and just explaining how you got involved. Hi everyone, so I'm Eliza Bolton um, and I work for F Secure Consulting as part of the IR team with Joni. Um, and I kind of, yeah, as, as Julia mentioned, I didn't actually have a computer when I applied for the job. I was very lucky that when I came in uh, to have my initial coffee, um, somebody, one of the team members kind of took me under their wing and lent me their computer, um, an old one. But so how I got into InfoSec, I, um, my brother actually works in the industry um, and I had, growing up, I'd never knew quite what I wanted to do. Um, and once he came into the industry, he was like, look, this, this is, um, he thought that I had like a good set, skill set for especially like IR. Um, and I was very lucky to, for him to introduce me to some of his colleagues. Um, who I came in and had a coffee with and had a chat to and met all the IR team. And then they were um, offering an internship um, specific to IR um, when I came in. And I decided after hearing all their cool stories and finding it super interesting to, um, to apply for the internship. Um, so I started coming, I came from a completely non-tech background, actually working in a &E as a nursing assistant beforehand. Um, and so no tech knowledge whatsoever, no, no tech knowledge whatsoever. Um, and um, yeah, I started my internship last year in May um, for 10 weeks, which was awesome. And I loved every moment of it. And um, it was going in because my aim was to then go into an associate role. Um, but um, coming from a non-tech background, I didn't quite have the knowledge um, and it was just a bit impossible to do it in that 10 weeks. So I was very lucky um, to then be offered a trainee associate to like kind of get me up to that um, level as associate. Um, you yeah, know, it's fantastic. It's um, it's it's a great industry to work in. Thanks, thanks, Eliza. I'm intrigued. Um, when your brother thought you might have good skills for IR, what do you think uh, he meant by that? So I've always had a love for numbers and problem solving, and like pattern recognition. Um, and to be fair, how I look at it is like when I worked in A and E, you never quite knew quite what was kind of come coming. Um, which I kind of feel like IR is very similar because you never know what the client's going to come in with, what problems they're going to have, and it's all about being like a little detective and figuring out what's going on, um, which is just amazing. 
Yeah, that's great, actually. Um, yeah, it's, it's a cool, uh, cool side of the business to be in, actually, being a detective when you put it like that. <laughs> if I could um, then come to, to you, Katie, again, if you don't mind just uh, telling us a little bit about yourself and, and how you got into the industry. Yeah, sure. Thanks, Julia. Um, so yeah, I'm Katie. Um, I'm a consultant at F-Secure. Um, currently head up our external asset mapping team um, and also very heavily involved with our continuous assurance team as well. Um, so I also come from a non-technical background, kind of seen a theme between us panellists tonight. So I'm wondering if it's common for women to come from non-technical backgrounds into security. So I don't know. But um, yeah, I, I actually have a degree in criminology. Um, and then came into the industry on a cybersecurity grad scheme. Um, so I spent a year doing the grad scheme and got experience from blue team and red team side, um, and then decided to stick with the red team side of things and more of the uh, offensive security. Um, so yeah, pretty much learned everything I know on the job. Um, and I think if like I had to give one piece of advice, I'd say try and learn how things work before you try and learn how to break them. So there's, there were some cases where I learned how to break things before I really understood how they actually worked. So for example, um, I learned how to port scan before I really knew what was happening when I ran a port scan. Um, but then there were some cases, for example, I learned how to write in Python. Um, I then developed a web application and then I learned how to break that web application by finding vulnerabilities in it. Um, and as a result of that, I'd say my application security knowledge is a lot stronger than perhaps my network security knowledge. Um, so yeah, I definitely suggest that to anyone looking to get into more of a, a technical role. Yeah, thanks, Katie. That's an interesting point you make there, actually. It's reminded me that when I first joined, uh, my first job in cybersecurity was with MWR, um, now F-Secure, um, and I was advised to watch some webinars by the uh, Harvard and uh, make their computer science uh, first year available on YouTube um, and it's much more accessible than, than it sounds. Um, at first I was I thought Harvard computer science so what, what, what am I going to uh, you know pick up from that um, but actually it was really accessible and it taught me a lot about logic and actually how you can apply logic to to cyber security and um, even just you know simple example of I think one of the things the lecturer does in the, in the very first lecture is uh, he has um, peanut butter bread and uh, jam and he asks his uh, his students to tell him as a computer how to make a peanut butter and jelly sandwich and uh, it's interesting to see all the steps and the you know he does exactly what they tell him to do and they go oh no you missed a step because he didn't actually pick up the knife or he didn't put it in the jar or and it, it teaches you sort of how you um, essentially you know, how, how computers work and and even listening to a few of those lectures you then start to think okay well as an attacker how do I then break that how do I sort of break the process or how do I insert something to that to make it malicious or uh, it really gave me a good understanding of just the logic behind it uh, but yeah Louise perhaps you could share share your experience uh, my experience of getting into information security. Yeah. <laughs> okay, it's it's a very long one, so I'll try and do the Cliff's Notes version of it. Um, so many many years ago, <laughs> I did a degree in um, makeup for the performing arts, so special effects makeup, obviously. And then um, I was living in London. I couldn't afford to work for free on film sets, so I ended up becoming a snowboard instructor. And then in my summers, when snow is not on the mountains. <laughs> I had to come up with a new job. So I came back to the UK each summer and had different temping jobs. And one of those ended up being working on a help desk. So as you can imagine from there, um, working on a help desk, ended up working on a help desk um, for a company called Land Security, a big property company in London. And um, I worked on that help desk for the next I think five or six years and from there I think I did internal moves only so I moved into the network team and so I learned the sort of the Cisco network engineering and did that route um, and then once I was working in that I found that that really wasn't for me <laughs> I was very much a square peg in a round hole um, working away from people after I'd been on the help desk for so long been sort of face to face with people for so long was very I don't know just didn't didn't fit 
with um, what I wanted to do. So, you know, being, you know, on, on command line and in front of machines and cables all the time, just it, it didn't didn't fill me with any passion at all. So luckily for me, my manager at that point, and this was probably about six years ago, had um, something in an audit report. And I think, you know, a lot of people in my world have roles due to audits. <laughs> um, they came up with the, the need to do um, a security awareness program. And um, looking at the rest of the network team, he decided that I was the only person with people skills in it. So <laughs> that I should be doing the security awareness program for them. Um, from there, it was a case of doing that half, half of the network engineer job, half of security awareness job, and then looking at the security awareness stuff that was around at the time. And it was, I don't know if anybody was a, you know, looking at anything similar at that, that time. And it was all click, 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 CBTs, very dull, very dry. Um, and the sort of stuff that you look at it and you think, this is never going to stick with me. I'm never going to learn. I'm never going to have any good habits off the back of this. So from there, I think I went through the Sand Secure the Human course, um, which was just like a little a little bubble of joy for me, like my people, <laughs> this is where I belong, this is fantastic. So I'm gonna try and move into that. Um, and I had been training as a security engineer and working as a security engineer at the time. And again, it was getting there because it was working back with, with more human traits. So human behavior in terms of what are people trying to do when they try to get into a company, when they try to break something, when they try to maliciously intercept something. Um, but the security awareness thing was really where I started to feel like I clicked. Um, um, and then from there, I went to Burberry for a couple of years to work as the security awareness manager um, and then on to my current job now. So, uh, yeah, it's been it's been around the houses kind of a trip and nothing that I ever thought I was going to do but interestingly when I did my A levels I chose art psychology and English language which my teacher at the time was horrified at because they couldn't think of any particular job that would require those three topics whatsoever and and yes to be fair they probably had a point at the time because my job didn't exist then but now I'm doing the job to some degree or other it does involve creativity it does involve psychology and it does involve a lot of language and communication so yeah it's um i don't know maybe i manifested it who knows <laughs> it's uh, it, it's probably to say that there are jobs that are coming that we can't even imagine um and there'll be jobs in 10 years time that don't exist now that will be really exciting so um i think the idea of a vocation that you're in for life is rare these days um you can, you can change your career at various points i don't think many of us will be in careers for life Yeah, so it's a really interesting point, Louise, and thanks for, for sharing your story. But yeah, I, I wondered just lastly then on this, uh, thinking about sort of the job seeker perspective um, and mentors and sort of changing what you're doing. Uh, Joni, if I could come to you, because uh, I think um, the way you approached your current role or decided to get into security is an interesting path as well. Yeah, so I also came from a non-tech background. Basically, the, sh the short version of my story is that I I started at what was then known as MWR, um, now F-Secure, uh, in the operations administrator role. And uh, I basically just started to spend some time with the, the guys who were hacking things. And at that stage, um, it was just a sort of a bug that bit me. I, I was super excited about everything that I could learn and about um, the possibilities of what I could do if I if I decided that this is something I, I wanted to do. And it absolutely was. And they were all very excited to teach me things. So I learned as much as I could. Um, somebody taught me po uh, password cracking, which was really, really fun. And um, I then just did a whole bunch of self-study on other concepts that I needed to get to a certain level where I could then apply for the internship while still working in the, the um, operations role. And I did the internship, learned a lot, uh, stressed a lot, felt like I was an imposter, but um, at the end I, I, got the, I got offered a role in the consultancy, which was ultimately my goal. Um, I spent some time doing the offensive security thing. I really loved it, um, but then I got more interested in digital forensics. So at that point, that led me into the incident response team where I had to sort of retrain new skills again. So I really loved the, the, the process of learning an entirely new field and it's, it's been something that's uh, really 
kept me going and, and kept me motivated. Yeah, thanks. I, th I think um, there's, a, there's a common theme around just being interested and, and having a go. <laughs> um, and uh, yeah, the imposter syndrome, I think, is happens to everybody and, and not just women. Um, and, and actually, I think you know, this is one of those industries that is changing. And as Louise said, we don't know what jobs might be available in years to come that we can't even imagine now. Um, so I imagine you know, all of us will probably go through imposter syndrome as changes happen. And um, I, I was reading an interesting article recently, I think it was um, the CISO of JP Morgan was talking about um, actually the importance of CISOs learning, having a learning mindset and being able to, to adapt um, and that being sort of the way to survive um, in cybersecurity, which I thought was interesting because so everyone's learning all the time, so, so why not join in? <laughs> but thinking about, I suppose, um, learning and what you think might be needed and that imposter syndrome, I wonder in fact whether that happens to people um, even when they, they see a job advert and they're thinking, well, there's a whole list of things on there that I can't do um, or I might never be able to do. And I'm sure there are other people who could do that better um, and you know, it might not even apply. Um, so if I if we sort of talk a little bit now about um, actually hiring, um, I know that some of you have uh, have gone through that process of, of writing job specs to hire into cybersecurity, be interested in in getting some of your perspectives. Um, and Caitlin, actually, could I come to you first? Uh, we haven't heard from you yet. Would you mind giving your background as well and then your perspective on hiring into cybersecurity? Yeah, of course. So I'm Caitlin. I am a managing consultant at F-Secure. Uh, and I actually did come from a technical background. I studied computer engineering at university, decided that I absolutely hated hardware and I wasn't sure about development. So I went looking for a different job. and. I found information security and I've never looked back. Um, I loved it. So that's how I got to, to be here. Um, and at this stage, I'm involved with a few things, one of which is the hiring process. Um, so I do see a fair few CVs. Um, and yeah, I think these, so when I hire, I'm usually looking at a pen testing role. So there are basics in terms of, you know, sort of networking, <laughs> um, and applications that you know what those are. Um, but you know, what really sort of sells somebody and makes a difference, and what I'm looking at is things like, you know, um, what are your communication skills like? So I say pen tester, but in reality, like it's not like you can just sit down, be the person in their hoodie, you know, um, bang away at the keyboard, find stuff and be done. So communication is massively important. I need to see somebody who can give me information who can adapt what they're saying to the different levels of people. Like you might come in with one impression about what I know or what I want from you and that capability to listen, to adapt. Um, and I think also with it, the understanding of and adjustment to a scenario where it's like, okay, given this, what can I do? Um, security is your priority, but it's not always somebody else's priority. Like when somebody's got a release, they don't want to hear me telling them, you've got this vulnerability and it's actually important that you fix it first. Um, so communication is a massive one for me. Um, also what we kind of call the curiosity mindset, which is, I think speaks to what Katie said, where you learn how to do something, learn how to fix it before you learn how to break it. So the people who kind of dive into something who want to understand a problem properly. Um, so will you demonstrate, you know, that you're not looking to just swipe a band-aid on and be done, but you really want to, you want to go in, you want to understand what's going on. Um, and you want to come up with something that works, but you want to come up with something that works for everything that's involved. You're not looking to just address a feature. And I think for me, those two are probably the biggest things that I look for. Um, and the next biggest that I look for is passion. Um, I, this is an industry where things do change, where your job can be <laughs> like my job now is not what my job was when I started. And I think there's been way more diverse like sort of changes than the ones that I've had. But you need somebody who really cares about what they're doing um, to keep up with what's going on. So whether that's keeping up from a technical perspective or moving yourself into a role that is what's right for you. So just seeing people who are like, this is what they care about. They want to do this right. Um, and also 
it's exciting and up to them that they'll do that. They'll do that tracking, they'll do that changing, they'll find the right space where they're really making the best difference. Um, yeah, those are probably my three key things. Thanks, Caitlin. Um, some good tips there for, for, um, for people who, who want to get into the industry and what, what people might be looking for as part of that, even in a technical role. Interesting to hear you talk there about the importance of being able to communicate. Um, and I know, Hannah, actually, that's something that um, you touched on when we spoke last around sort of that sort of communicating with the business and actually being able to put things into uh, risk terms or business terms or, you know, um, impact, I suppose, of security. Um, and I know you did some work to, to break down your roles when you were thinking about hiring um, in terms of what actually is needed. Um, and perhaps you could tell us a little bit about that process. Um, yeah, so thank you. Um, one of the things that we um, changed in our um, job specs was we 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 focused more on um, people call them softer skills, but we focused more on those um, uh, those transferable skills like communication, organisation, um, but also um, looking at um, wanting uh, our candidates to um, showcase in their um, experience or or how they would approach them and show empathy because we have to empathize with our with our business you know they don't necessarily understand the technical jargon so we need to help them and we need to understand that where their limitations are so we can take them on a journey um, and we can highlight what their risks are um, but we also need to empathize with our more technical um, colleagues say a pen tester um, who is very good at all the very you know detailed and complex elements um, but then we work with them to be able to communicate it so that the actual business understands um, you know and, and understands what the risk potentially is or the vulnerability is um, and we focus on um, you know really making sure that um, we're looking for people who are passionate around um, uh, development eager to learn because this world does change um, on a regular basis new technology comes along um, we're also very interested in problem solving so it sounds like our engagement should be relatively routine but we are dealing with people and people have good days they have bad days they have different um, understanding in a particular subject matter and sometimes your general approach um, for uh, the the roles that we um, have have got is that you have to adapt to the people that you're talking to at a very quick space or you know work over um, you know work around a particular technical challenge say to enable an assessment to take place and for us to get the the best um, from that particular engagement so um, yeah and and what we realized was by changing our job spec um, that actually enabled um, more ladies feeling comfortable to actually apply um, you know and I do um, I started off as service management um, to, and I've learned my technical skills as I've been going through so for me it's you know, if you can demonstrate and you can articulate within your job spec the actual core qualities that you're looking for for the person, and then as as the rest of the panel have have sort of articulated, you can then develop your technical skills on top of that and become specialist in whatever area you then want to 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 go in. And one of my team is absolutely loving the whole cloud space, so has has decided that that's what they're going to do. You know, um, so. Eagerness, e eagerness to learn, definitely. Yeah, thanks, Hannah. That's um, it's really interesting, and um, it's perhaps people aren't aware that um, companies are open to sort of you know looking for potential and, and training uh, on the job, and and actually some of those core transferable skills are are really important um, and shouldn't be ignored if they see them on a job spec, job spec and zoom straight into the certification and assume they can't do it <laughs> um, because it may well be that actually there's a path there to learn while you're there. Um, Emma, if I could just um, come to you perhaps on that point of potential because um, you shared a really interesting anecdote with me um, around sort of where you can, might be able to find potential. I think it was when you were speaking to a recruitment firm uh, and some of the, uh, the people that they might have hired or surprising backgrounds perhaps. 
Yeah, and I think I think you know we need diversity um, within within information security and cyber security. Traditionally, everybody thought that a hacker was you know a particular demographic of person sitting in their bedroom in the dark with a hoodie doing attacking. Right? We know that that's changing. There was a, a huge cyber attack last year, and it was out as a female adversary was actually the attacker. So that's one of the first times I've actually heard of the the, the bad guy being a lady, which is like you know in some ways great. It means that we're getting you know technical people but we need to think we need to have diversity of thought okay so we need to think if we're defending something we need to think like our, our, our attackers and, and think with a mixed demographic so we need to think um with diversity of thought that might map to gender okay so it might be that you know we've talked about lots of transferable skills that you know perhaps some you know females are you know perhaps generalized you know have, have more empathy and, and think in a different way but I was talking to um, a, a vendor of mine saying no I'm hiring um, I was saying you know we've got some roles that people aren't applying for and I, and I, and I can't work out why um, you know and I think it's a game for th this vendor came back to me and said that they have basically taken all of the technical tooling off of their job descriptions they said well, we can teach that and I think this panel has proved that you can learn tools you can learn technical things if you have that right mindset so they said we just don't put any tooling on there we we guarantee that we're gonna we're gonna teach it and um, so they just basically hired they said I've just hired a drummer a professional drummer into our into our, our team I'm like okay it's random they know patterns okay so they're going to be a data scientist and a, and a threat intelligence person for this this vendor because they understand patterns and they can see flows and they can understand how things change so they can see an anomaly in a pattern and and in a flow so i thought like, okay that so it made me challenge how i'm thinking about what you know who we're hiring and what we're hiring and if you think about it the the first sort of uk cyber cyber challenge was run one by a postman OK, you know, who'd never had an IT background before. But again, it's, it's, it's thinking about what those transferable skills are and, and, and looking at that. So it's really made, challenged me to think about what I'm looking for. You know, the tool set will be different next year. This is such a changing you know, place. Why are we hiring people who know a certain set of tools when the tools will be different in next year and the year after and the year after? But we'll, we'll adapt and learn, you know, and over the, my 25 years in tech, the amount of different systems that you learn and you, you you process but it's about having people who are inquisitive who want to know why and how and what would happen if you know those are much more transferable skills and then you, you can teach the other bits on top so it's challenged me to think about that and i think that's where we get to um it also means that I've also been on the, the receiver and when I've looked at a job spec and, you know, it doesn't matter what level you're at, you get that imposter syndrome thinking about, oh, well, I only know sort of like 70 percent of the things that they've got in there. You know, have a go. Like, you know, what, why not? You've got nothing to lose. And even if it's not 100 percent right, you'll learn something and you'd be surprised at all the things you'll bring to the table. Like Eliza, you know, working in A&E and, you know, myself, like, you know, A, you said about, you know, being a detective and asking, trying to work things out and analyze stuff, but also calling a crisis and being able to handle an emergency and, and stress of you know, not knowing what's coming around the corner. They're all examples of, you know, really good transferable skills that I think we need to start thinking about what else rather than just a, a list of, you know, requirements and, and, and qualifications. Yeah, thanks, Emma. It's really, uh, really good, important points there. Um, and um, yeah, I think it's it's important to, I particularly like the idea of um, thinking about the attackers and, and actually maybe that's where the, um, the the wrong reputation of the industry has in terms of sort of in people's minds. If they see the hacker in the hoodie, they assume you sort of need to be a hacker in a hoodie to defend against it or to work in the industry. Um, it's perhaps even just changing people's perception of attackers and actually you know, attackers as organisations, in fact, um, funded to attack. Um, we do have a few questions in. So um, firstly, we've had a question come in about, um, we, we've spoken a lot about, you know, if you're curious, um, you can go and find out about things. Um, and uh, I wondered, so the question here about are there any recommendations for self-study qualifications or courses? Um, Caitlin. <laughs> so self-study, um, I'm personally a fan of Hack the Box and Try Hack Me. Um, I don't think they're entirely free, but I do think they're quite accessible. Um, I also <laughs> frankly generally recommend YouTube. 
So as you work through a concept, like there will be a YouTube video that tells you what you need to know. Um, so yeah, those would be my two. Thanks, Caitlin. Yeah. So hack the box and sorry, I'm going to go on. No, I was just going to reiterate. Um, I think YouTube is a great starting point for bite size, um, and um, and you can get um, some um, dummy trials and things online. But yeah, I think YouTube is brilliant. It's a starting point. Yeah, from sorry, from my point of view, uh, try hack me is really good. It's, um, it most of it is actually free. I think it's only eight pounds a month if you want the VIP one, but you can do a lot on in the free version. Um, but to whoever asks that question, I have a whole list of um, qualifications and certifications you can you can look into. If you contact me on LinkedIn, I can send those through. Great, thanks, Jenny. Just reading, just reading rather than just thinking about the qualifications is such a broad spectrum of ways you can get into information security in a variety of different roles. So I'll just say read out on the subject, Julia, you mentioned, I think, you know, the Harvard, their first year, you know, until you, you might not necessarily know where, which area you want to go into. So you might want to be the person doing the hacking and and and, and doing that, that the online testing, but you also might want to be on the soft skills side of things like Louise. So I should just, just read and, and there's, there's so much information out there. Um, YouTube, I think, is a really good place to start because there's some really great lectures that are online. There is another question about um, news forums um, or media channels. Um, so this is about specifically cyber incidents. So um, does anybody have particular suggestions on which are the best sources of information on cyber incidents? Yeah, I'll jump in there. Oh, um, so interestingly, I find Twitter to be one of the best sources of um, information for like incidents and keeping up to date with like vulnerabilities and stuff like that. Um, so if you follow like quite a lot of um, security people or people in the industry, um, like nine times out of ten, I've heard about things on Twitter before I've seen it on news articles and things like that. Um, and particularly around write ups as well around different vulnerabilities it's was really useful. Um, to look at Twitter for that. It's safe to say there's there's quite a lot of infosec drama on Twitter sometimes, so you have to wade through that now and then. Um, but yeah, it's definitely been useful for me. But other than that, things like um, uh, the Register, the Hacker News, um, Security Affairs, all really good like security news forums as well that I would recommend. Yeah, some podcasts uh, that I recommend, uh, Risky Business, um, Malicious Life, and uh, Darknet Diaries. Those are really good podcasts on cyber incidents. I think that's the questions. Um, and if I could just actually ask ask a question maybe to, to, to finish, um, and it would just perhaps be to, to all of you, um, I think basically what we've discovered tonight is is that it's you know cyber security or getting into the industry um, it is accessible it doesn't matter if you haven't done it at uni or if you feel as though perhaps you're not technically minded or even if you are technically minded that you maybe you don't have um, the, the right qualifications yet or you've seen a job you might be interested in, um, in but you, you know you don't think you've perhaps uh, covered all of the requirements um, I think just giving it a go is really important and you know, we've got some great success stories here and it's been fantastic and thank you all for, for sharing those backgrounds because I think it just goes to show um, that it can be really varied um, and that there's no yeah there's nothing holding you back. Um, my question would be if we could change one thing it would be um, anyone want to, to go first on that one? For me it's the term I am technical or non-technical. Now I actually think that there are different um, degrees of technical awareness. And I think once we all, if we're on this web, if we're on this you know, forum, we have some sort of technical awareness. If we can use a mobile phone, we have technical awareness. So I think that that would be my biggest takeaway and something I'd like to see. Um, and I think that that will then uh, hopefully help people feel more confident when discussing roles in technology. Yeah, I was just going to say, um, you know, use your network. So events like this, 
this are, are brilliant because they help to you know inspire people um you know provide role models um well, certainly when i got into technology you know i would always be the only female on the floor you know i'd go to conferences and everyone would go oh you must be emma because i was the only female name on the attendee list you know that's thankfully changed um, you know, there's still environments where, you know, we are a minority. So I think it's really important to have events like this where we can showcase people in, you know, successful careers who can be role models um, and, 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 and think more broadly than that. But, you know, in case of give it a go, you, you have nothing to lose and all you will do is learn on every step. And some of these roles might be, you know, not the perfect one, not the end one. But as you move around, you'll pick up transferable skills along the way. So just have a go. Well, we've got some, some really great closing points there, I think. And um, yeah, have a go is a nice way to, to end the session, I think. Um, and thank you very much, everybody who has joined and to all the panellists. Um, I personally found this a really exciting, interesting session. Um, and it's in, inspiring me to, to go on and uh, do more in cybersecurity and, uh, and get involved and have more of this type of discussion because, um, yeah, let, let's help everyone out and help them see what's available.